Okay, good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome. Thank you very much for joining today. Um, if you have a web camera and you'd like to turn it on, feel free. Um, you're welcome to leave your cameras off. It's sort of up to you. So welcome to our online workshop. Uh, today, we are going to be covering lots of interesting things. And I hope that this is going to be useful for you. Um, so let's go ahead and get started. Um, certainly, if you have any questions or comments throughout, please leave them in the chat window. And uh, I will do my best to answer them, or we can find some time at the end. So today, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, the difference between what is emergency remote teaching, or ERT, versus online teaching. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about Google Forms and how we can use that in our classroom. We'll talk a little bit about Flipgrid. Um, some of you have already posted videos to Flipgrid, which is wonderful. Thank you very, very much for doing that. And hopefully, Flipgrid can become a space where we can share ideas. And then I will end with a quick closing. So one of the, my goals today is while we are doing the, the um, online workshop, I would actually like to practice using some of these tools. So uh, the first thing I would like everyone to do is to complete this survey. Um, I will very quickly send it to you in the chat, or what you can do is use a, the QR code. So um, simply, most phones these days, if you just point your camera at the screen, please go ahead and fill out this Google Form survey right now. I'll give everybody about three or four minutes. It shouldn't take you very, very long. So please go ahead and complete this now. I'll come back in just one moment. Please go ahead. If you're just joining us, please complete this Google Form survey if you can. Okay, if you're just joining us, uh, please go ahead and fill out this Google Form survey. Uh, it should be very, very quick. Again, you can just use your phone, or uh, I will put, again, the link in our chat window. Okay, give everybody just one or two more minutes quickly. And then we'll have a look at some of the results. So what you are seeing now on your screen is the results from the survey. Um, this is sort of the power of Google Forms. And it's something that I use very often with my class. Um, so it looks like right now uh, we've received six responses. Most people are 
in from Pakistan. Uh, excellent, we've got somebody in from Argentina that is joining us. And the nice thing about Google Forms is that you can actually show your students uh, this kind of thing instantly by sharing your screen um, and seeing the information come in in real time. So uh, we just scribble down a little bit here. Uh, the people in the audience, it looks like the vast majority of people have six or more years of uh, teaching English, which is wonderful. So very, very experienced group of teachers and professors that are with us today. Google Forms, uh, it looks like there is a wide range of different types of experience with Google Forms. Um, it looks like most people though are familiar with it and have used it before. Hopefully today you will learn some, um, possibly some new tricks or ideas using it. And Flipgrid, it looks like most people have never used Flipgrid before. Uh, this is something that I have discovered this past semester, and it has been a very, very powerful tool for me in my teaching classroom. Uh, so we're going to talk a little bit more about Flipgrid, and hopefully at the end, uh, everyone here will be brave enough to post a video sharing their experience. Biggest challenges during uh, the pandemic have been a sudden shift from in-person teaching to teaching online. That is the vast majority of people. It looks like uh, poor Wi-Fi and technical support for your students comes in at a close. Third, favorite food. We have all sorts of wonderful types of food from rice to birani, chana. Excellent, okay, wonderful. Thank you everyone for filling that in. Now, part of the reason that I wanted to get that information is, okay, so sorry, first let me introduce myself a little tiny bit here. Uh, we're gonna do something called Two Truths and a Lie. For those of you that are not familiar with Two Truths and a Lie, I'm going to show you Three sentences, two of them are true about myself, one of them is a lie. Your job is to try to figure out which one is the lie. So the first one, uh, I am a recent graduate from Kyoto University in Global Environmental Studies. I've been teaching English for over 12 years at the university level. And I'm originally from Canada, but I now live in Tokyo. So we're going to do a quick poll. This is something that is very, very useful on Zoom, something that you can set up. So everyone right now, you should be able to see on your screen a poll. Please guess which one is the lie. Is it A, B, or C? Okay, four respondents out of 16 so far. Okay, nine out of 17 respondents. We've got 52% that have voted at this point. Now, uh, just to talk a little bit about polling, um, polling is something, if you are using Zoom, it is something that you can set up on the website itself. And it is a very, very powerful tool that you can use with your students to quickly get information from everyone. Uh, I'll leave the poll open just for another 20 seconds. So if you haven't, uh, please go ahead and complete the poll now. Okay, five seconds. All right, let's have a look at the results of the poll. So, it looks like most people believe that number one is the lie, uh, followed by C and B, or, or sorry, and B. So, uh, in truth, in actuality, um, C is the lie. So, I am 
a recent graduate of Kyoto University in Global Environmental Studies. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about my research in a moment. Uh, I have been teaching English in different universities for over 12 years now. Um, my focus these days is a lot more on CLIL, uh, which is content and language integrated learning. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. And the last one is sort of true. Uh, I am originally from Canada, but I now live in Kobe, Japan. So Kobe is a small city outside of Osaka. Uh, and I teach at a university called Konan University. So thank you very, very much for completing that poll. Okay, let's move on and, whoops, excuse me. Let me tell you a little bit about my research. So uh, what I did my PhD in is global environmental studies. And what I focused on was where sustainable development, so these are, most of you would be familiar with the sustainable development goals, and uh, English language education, where they meet. And I've sort of uh, created a new field called LESD, or Language Education for Sustainable Development. Now, today's workshop is not going to be about LESD, um, but I will be sharing some information um, with you all. And if you're interested in the research, uh, there will be some links and please get in touch with me if you're interested in this field. So why in the world am I teaching about online teaching um, today, giving this workshop? Like you, uh, I've been thrust into online teaching and I've learned a lot and I hope to be able to share those things with you today. So before we begin, let me send you a file. Uh, this file is basically today's handout. Uh, it will have lots of links on it at the end and then also some important links uh, to research and whatnot. If you are interested, there is a lot of information there and I will be referring to those links uh, as we go along. Okay, so I wanted to really talk about something that I think is a big misunderstanding. Um, because of COVID-19 and the pandemic, we have all been suddenly thrust online. If you were doing person-to-person -person teaching before, uh, you are now online teaching. And there is a lot of confusion between what we are doing. A lot of people think we are doing online teaching. And in fact, we, we really aren't doing online teaching. Online engagement, as the quote is talking about, takes a tremendous amount of work and planning in advance. And like the survey that we did earlier showed, uh, this sudden switch from person to person to online teaching, this is not really online teaching. Uh, this is emergency remote teaching. So what does that term mean? What is ERT? Let's first talk about some of the details about online teaching, because I think this is quite important. So online teaching, if you have a proper online course, this is something that takes a lot of time and effort to develop in advance. Typically, it's six months in advance that you are creating materials and developing things for an online atmosphere. Um, it's meant to be a long-term solution. So this is something that if your university is doing online teaching, you are using it every single semester, for instance. It's not something that's urgent. It's something that's planned methodically and thought about in advance. It has the support of your university, a lot of support. So it has faculty members, IT people, and the students are voluntarily enlisting for online teaching. Now, if you recognize that as online teaching, you know that most of us are not doing that this semester. Most of us have suddenly been thrust online, so there hasn't been a lot of time and development in these courses. We're scrambling to get things ready. It has been very urgent. 
the global pandemic tends to do that to people. Uh, it's a short-term solution. We are, we are hoping that we find uh, solutions to this COVID-19 uh, in the near term, in the next two years, and we can start going back to normal types of teaching. So it's very important to understand that emergency remote teaching is very, very different. We are reacting to this crisis and it's really beyond our control. It's a pandemic. Uh, it is meant to be temporary. Uh, and I, I understand that there's an argument there where our entire teaching world is going to be changed because of this pandemic. But eventually we are going to be moving back into the classroom. Uh, whether that is some sort of a hybrid model, uh, I know my university here is considering different ways to do that in the fall, which might mean the classes are halved. So half the classes are online, half the classes are in person. And that means that we, we lower the amount of students that are in a group. Um, it lacks resources. So suddenly being thrust online means that you do not have access to a lot of resources that you would for an online teaching courses. For example, IT people, um, I know my university, they're not very helpful right now with developing courses because they are dealing with Wi-Fi issues and getting students online and computer issues. Um, and of course, students don't have a choice. A lot of our students are very unhappy about suddenly being pushed online. Um, I have first year undergraduate students that are quite sad that they're not able to interact with each other online. So, when we talk about this situation, um, and I, especially if you're looking at the literature, I think it's very important to know what we're doing. So this idea of emergency remote teaching should stick in your mind. Uh, we are reacting to a situation and trying to do something. So this workshop is really meant to help support you with this ERT. So couple of things that are very, very useful and things to think about. You'll notice that there's a source at the bottom. Um, the PDF that I sent you earlier has all of these sources there um, as useful materials and references if you would like. So it's really important to communicate frequently and honestly. So that's communicating with our students um, as much as possible and, and being honest with them. If you're having Wi-Fi problems, let the students know that. Um, if you're not sure how to use a program that you're going to try today, right? If you're trying Flipgrid for the first time, for ex example, be honest with the students because they are in a similar circumstance and they will understand. We need to prioritize our needs as teachers um, and what is best in our classroom. This means, uh, well, to give a, a, an example on my end, um, we had a very detailed curriculum developed for an undergraduate course on global challenges. Uh, this is a, a language and content course. And the course is quite heavy uh, for the students. We were suddenly online and we had to throw out about 20% of the material because it just would not function. We had to prioritize what we could do in the classroom, um, what was fair for our students. So we learned a lot about that. Being flexible again, um, just like prioritizing needs, we need to understand that students are going to have Wi-Fi issues or computer issues, and we need to be responsive to those things. This is a lesson that I learned uh, a very difficult way this past semester. We need to keep things as simple as possible. Um, at our university, we had uh, an extensive reading program um, and we were using all sorts of different resources online and we were using mostly our library's books. And of course, suddenly students cannot go and get extensive readers from the library. So we really had to figure out what would be an easy solution, something that's digital. And we found something, but it wasn't until about halfway through the semester and it was a lot of difficulty in the beginning, a lot of resistance to making those changes. Um, but when we did, it was easier for us and the students. 
And of course, establish routines and schedules. Um, students get used to a certain way of doing things. Uh, for example, I use Google Forms as an attendance sheet at the beginning of every class. And the students, um, at first it was a bit strange for them, but then they got very used to using those QR codes. It became an automatic way. And it was a way for me to ask some questions and get feedback from students um, and, and actually be able to interact a little bit with students on uh, Zoom. So I was, like I showed you earlier, the results of our survey, uh, I'm able to interact with the students and, and let them know that I'm responding to their needs. So these routines, these schedules are very important. And of course, collaborating with others. So uh, I'm very, very thankful to uh, Warda Rizvi for organizing this because this is a way that we can collaborate, where we can learn from each other um, because all of us have different experiences, different contexts, but we've all been thrust into the same situation. So collaborating with your colleagues, collaborating online, these are all very important ways to do it. Okay, let's talk about Google Forms. So Google Forms are a very, very useful tool. And it's something that I found that has been very, very powerful for me in the language classroom. And Google Forms can do all sorts of different things. So I'm going to put you in the driver's seat again, and I'm going to ask that you take a small quiz. Please jump online right now. Um, whoops, sorry. Let me just get out of here for one moment. I will put this in the chat window. Um, if you can, you can use your phone to scan the QR code. Uh, oh, there's my chat windows disappeared. Okay, so let me put it in the chat right now. Please go ahead and complete this survey right now. Again, uh, if you're just joining us, you can use your phone and just your camera app to take a picture of the QR code and it will take you directly there. So I'll give everyone about um, three or four minutes. Please go ahead and complete this survey right now. I should say, of course, this is a quiz, but it's not worth any marks. There's no pressure if you get anything wrong. So please uh, go ahead and do this right now. And I will show you what this looks like uh, once we start getting a couple more results. Okay, so the quiz um, was a very, very short quiz. Um, another amazing use for Google Forms is setting up a quiz that can automatically give students feedback. Now, uh, I have actually started using this in larger classrooms for exams and assessment. Uh, doing the same sort of thing. So some advantages are it is automatically marked and you can get almost instant results. Another nice thing about Google Forms is you can actually set it up so that some of the test is automatically marked. For example, if there's multiple choice questions and then if there's short written answer questions, 
it has the ability that you can actually enter the scores for those individual sections and then you can release the uh, scores to your students through email. Uh, so it is really quite a powerful tool. Okay, let's take a quick look how everyone's doing. So um, ERT stands for Emergency Remote Teaching. I uh, put in a couple of different things. So I noticed there is some correct answers that were marked incorrectly. Uh, I didn't, uh, I only put in the answer key for everything in small letters. So emergency remote teaching, everything in small letters, and then emergency remote teaching where emergency E was capitalized, remote was capitalized, teaching was capitalized. You could put in several more. Um, so those people that did get it wrong, for example, uh, this person here has the right answer, but it was marked incorrectly. So these are things that you can address afterward by changing the answer key. Um, so this past semester during COVID-19, we talked a little bit about this, but it is emergency remote teaching. We really are not online teaching. Um, again, online teaching takes six months in advance to prepare and to develop. If you've ever taken an online course through edX, for example, you understand how thorough those courses are. Lecture videos are set up beforehand. Assessments are set up beforehand. We were not doing that. So really this semester, we are emergency remote teaching and possibly for the foreseeable future, depending on your schools or your universities. Um, online teaching, yes, uh, takes a lot of effort to design, develop effective, engaging online education. And just to emphasize that again, this is not what we're doing this semester. Of course, we've been working hard behind the scenes, but it's been reacting to a global crisis, uh, not preparing six months in advance for it. So we are ERT this year. And yes, everyone got that question right. Thank you very much. And my research is called Language Education for Sustainable Development. Um, I will there's some resources on that handout that I gave you if you are interested. And I'll talk a little bit more about that at the end. Okay, so showing you a little bit of information about how powerful Google Form is. Uh, now, this is uh, Google Forms and what it looks like. Uh, if you have a Google account or Gmail account, you have access to Google Forms. And you'll notice up at the top of the page, there are several pre-made forms that you can use. So event feedback, um, assessment. So if you wanna create a test, you can use this template and it will show you some basic kinds of questions that you can use. I oftentimes set up my own. Um, and I use Google Forms for a lot of things in my classroom. I use it for attendance for every single class. And for that attendance form, I use the same form, but every single class, I change some of the questions. Um, so I ask about the homework, for example, or I do small surveys. And it is a really powerful way, again, to interact with your students at the beginning of class. And it only takes five minutes or less. Um, once the students are used to it, they immediately go and complete it. It's very, very, very powerful tool. I've also used it for assessment. Uh, so you'll notice down in the bottom right hand side, it has vocabulary tests. Um, we have a, a Cube English course that uses, basically it's TOEIC or NGSL words, the new general service list for words. And we use it for um, exams. So like I mentioned before, we have the first two parts of the exam are multiple choice and they're automatically marked on Google Forms. And then we have the last section where the students write sentences with a vocabulary word and teachers have to go in and give marks to each of those sentences. And then you can release all of those marks through Google Forms um, if you've turned on the email. So this is a really powerful way. 
Like I mentioned before, it's free with a Google account. It's powerful and it's relatively simple to learn and to understand how to use it. For emergency remote teaching, uh, this really has been something that I've found very, very, very useful this semester. Like I said, I use it for my attendance in every single one of my classes. Um, I use it for quizzes. Uh, I use it for tests, simple surveys, and my university has also started using it for course evaluations, where students can go online, complete the Google form, and then our university has information. Um, and we can do it from several classes at a time. Google has a really powerful suite where everything can be exported to an Excel sheet, so you can instantly get those marks and uh, use them for the evaluation purposes. What's very, very nice is some of you are using mobile phones. You can easily use Google Forms on a mobile phone. It is already built for mobile, which is very, very powerful. Some of our students, of course, are struggling. Maybe they don't have access to good Wi-Fi for their computers, but they do have mobile internet. Um, so this is a powerful way that students can still use these things, even if they're entering Zoom with their cell phones. And it's relatively easy to set up and deploy. When I say relatively, there is a little bit of a learning curve, but um, hopefully I've showed you a little bit if you're unfamiliar with Google Forms. There are several different ways to do it. There are templates available. Um, and it's, it's quite a powerful way to jump online and to do that. So uh, the template gallery, like I mentioned before, is a very, very powerful place where you can get these pre-made parts. If you want to share a link, so as you've seen, I've been sharing links to my forms with you. In the top right hand corner of the Google form, there is a button that says send. And this button has a lot of uh, sort of some detailed information. You can input student emails, which is, you'll notice the little letter send via. I have been clicking on the link tab and sharing the actual link. And I typically shorten the URL just to make it a little bit easier for myself. So it, it gives you a shortened down URL. Now, you'll notice that I'm also using QR codes. I've found very, very early that a lot of students that are using their mobiles only or have spotty Wi-Fi, creating QR codes is very, very powerful. And again, there are a lot of resources. Um, this is a QR code generator. It is absolutely free and accessible online. It's the one that I typically use. You can see on the left, you simply add a URL. You click the download JPG button at the bottom and it will give you a QR code for any internet link that you have. Now, I think this is quite a powerful way uh, to use these. You can put them on slides and students easily can access them. Um, our students are very, very savvy and oftentimes without me even saying anything, they've already got their phones out. They're using their uh, photo app to scan the QR code and they know exactly what to do. So it is a very, very, very powerful way to use all of these types of things. Um, I would just like to show you, just very, very, very quickly, the document that I sent through the chat window earlier. Um, you will notice down at the very bottom here, I have some resources for emergency remote teaching, if you are interested to learn a little bit more. Again, most people are saying that we're doing online teaching, but in fact, it, it really is emergency remote teaching. And this will put it in perspective. And to be honest, it, after looking at a little bit of the literature, 
it made me feel much better about what I was able to do and being realistic about it. Google Forms, uh, there is some great resources here. Google itself has a great support website. And here is um, some practical ways to use Google Forms in an environment. Again, please experiment with it if you aren't as familiar. I know many of you have already taken workshops using Google Forms, which is wonderful. Um, but there are a lot of advanced features that you can do. I will talk about Flipgrid here in a minute. I know there was some questions earlier about Flipgrid. Um, down at the very bottom here, you'll notice this is the QR code generator that I showed you a minute ago. Again, there are several online. If you do a quick Google search for QR code generator, um, this is one that I use. And again, put in a link, it spits out a QR code, and then you can add that to any of the documentation that you might have had. Um, great, so that is the handout. Um, I know some people joined us a little bit late, so I'm gonna just send that handout one more time through, you can find that in the chat area. Um, if you have any specific questions about what I'm talking about, feel free to add that into the chat and I will do my best to talk about those things as we go along. Okay, uh, right now I have one more poll I would like to give you guys. Just one moment. All right, um, here is the poll. I've just launched it. Please go ahead and complete this right now. I'll give everybody a couple of minutes and then I will share the results. Okay, two or three minutes. Thank you. <clears throat> okay, I'm going to give everybody just another 30 seconds. So 30 seconds. If you haven't completed the poll, please go ahead and do that now. All right, thank you very, very much. Um, let me show you the results. So you should be able to see the results right now. Uh, the most common ways that people are using Google Forms. It looks like several people have not used Google Forms. Uh, most people are using it for quizzes and tests, which it is very, very powerful for. Uh, it doesn't look like anybody's using it for course surveys, which I'm surprised about. Those are very, very powerful ways to quickly use, um, get information from your students and be able to share it on your screen. Okay, wonderful. Thank you all very, very much. So again, uh, just to talk a little bit about the polls, these Zoom polls are a very powerful way uh, to use in Zoom. Um, if you are using Zoom in the classroom, again, you need to go to their website and sign in through the website. And then once you click on your meeting, there is an option at the bottom to develop and build polls. And you can create multiple questions. And this is another powerful way to quickly get information. It does take some preparation in advance. So you really have to think about what you want to present to students beforehand to do it. Okay, let's move on to 
one of the final sections that we're going to talk about today. And this section looks like it's the one that most people know the least about. So I'm going to talk about this in as much detail as I can uh, with the time that we have. And again, if you have questions, please let me know. Okay. So Flipgrid, what is it? On Flipgrid's website, they talk about it being 100% free for all educators. Uh, you can basically use this to create short videos and share them with students. Now, one of the powerful features of this is that you don't have to worry about storage, storing videos on your own you know, channels or computers. Everything is done offline, which is great. It's also powerful because students can comment on each other's videos, which is really, really wonderful. Now, one of the things that I would love for us to do today, and I'm going to give you a little bit of homework, is I would like all of you to actually flip through. Somebody microphone is on. Not sure whose microphone is on. Okay, thank you. All right, um, so I, I'll talk a little bit about Flipgrid and how it works. This here is an image of the Flipgrids that I have set up with my students. Now you'll notice, uh, let me just show you a couple things. So we've got the workshop Flipgrid. Uh, hopefully you received an email from me last night. Uh, if you did not, that PDF that I sent you has the link and has the password to get in. I would strongly encourage you to create a video uh, after this workshop so that we can all share each other's knowledge. Again, we have a lot of very bright people with a lot of experience. So we are going to want to share these ideas together. Now, I've used this for my global challenges class. Um, and what the students have done is they create videos based on their homework. To give you a bit of an example of what these kinds of videos look like, uh, I would like to just show you my Flipgrid right now. Just one moment. Okay, so uh, if you can, hopefully you can see, this is my Flipgrid here. Now, my global challenges class, for example, what I've done is I've set up some assignments for students to take. So I'll just show you really briefly what this looks like. The students in this class are studying the sustainable development goals, which is something that I'm very, very interested in in my research. And what I've done is I've given the students a very, very clear set of things to speak about in their video. Now, these videos are very short. Um, as a teacher and educator, you have a lot of control over how long your videos are. If you want them to be just one minute or you want them to be up to five minutes. And I've asked my students these questions here. So, what is your favorite SDG and why? Um, each student has their own country from across the world that they research throughout the course. What is the most surprising thing you learned? Uh, biggest global challenge, and then any closing comments. Now, what is really powerful, I'll just show you really briefly. I've got lots of videos from the students, and you'll notice that you see these little circles here in the middle. These are replies. So, um, without showing you, this is one of my students here. He's created a video. And you'll notice down at the bottom that we have two replies to him. So there has been students that have responded directly to what he has said, which is really, really, really uh, excellent way to get the students to interact. I have a lot of first year students that are missing out on the experience of being in a classroom with other students. 
Uh, I certainly had a lot of fun in my first year undergraduate university experience, you know, meeting new people. These students miss out on this. And Flipgrid is a way, I mean, it's not a perfect way, but it is a way that they can interact with each other, uh, comment on the videos. So it is a really, really powerful way to get students to engage. So, why would we want to use this? Well, if you have a Google or a Microsoft account, um, I know my university is using Microsoft's suite, um, but a Gmail account would work as well. Again, powerful, powerful and simple tools to use online. One of the things that I, I haven't personally done this yet, um, but I know some, of, some friends of mine that are teaching at other universities and high schools here in Japan, and they are using it as a speaking assessment tool. So if you're teaching a simple speaking class, you can get the students to speak three or four sentences, for example. And there are also tools for built-in assessment where you can give feedback to the students individually. It is a really, really interesting platform for doing those types of things. Now, this is something that surprised me. Um, it's very intuitive and fun for students. Once you set it up, I really didn't have to do a lot of training for my students. Uh, again, students are very tech savvy. They see a QR code or a link and immediately they can jump online. And the students are able to decorate their videos with emoji and with words. And the students have done an exceptionally good job without me doing any further training. They also watch other students' videos, learn from those videos, and then create their own. So it is a really, really great platform. Point them in the right direction, and students will do it. And another thing, uh, if students do have a phone, uh, any kind of a mobile phone, whether it's Android or iOS, they can download the Flipgrid app and do everything using their mobile phones. Um, they can record the video on their mobile phones. They can edit the video on their mobile phones. It is a very, very plow powerful template uh, to do that kind of stuff in our classrooms. So this is our workshop Flipgrid that I've created. And I'm going to just share this information right now. Um, I would like everybody that is joining the workshop to please create one video. This is your homework this time around. Um, again, it is relatively easy. Please go follow the link that is there. You will be able to access the videos that are already there. And thank you very much. There's been a couple of participants who have already created videos. And it is really exciting to hear from colleagues all over the world, um, from Argentina, from Egypt, from Pakistan. And this is an opportunity for us to share tips and then also to comment on each other's videos. So let me just show you that very, very quickly, just so that it is uh, very, very clear what I would like you to do. Now, when you use the link that I've given you, I'll just show you here one moment. This is what you're going to see. Okay, you're going to see a login screen that looks like this. Hopefully, uh, my internet is going to work. Great, so it's workshop. You are going to simply enter in the password that I gave you, which is workshop 2020, capital W, workshop 2020. You enter in and immediately you are going to see our Flipgrid. Uh, here is a video from me. Here is the instructions for what I would like you to talk about, but feel free to talk about anything else that you would like. And then down at the bottom here, we can already see that we have some videos um, from participants from around the world. 
And I've gone ahead and commented on a couple of these videos, which is really wonderful. So when you click on a video, for example, uh, you are able to push the reply button and it will prompt you to log in and you are able to instantly create a response to these types of videos. So please go and do that after uh, the workshop today. I would love, I'm gonna keep the Flipgrid open for about another week or two. Um, hopefully we can get some conversations going on the Flipgrid and we can use that. Uh, some people mentioned in the Zoom that the password isn't working. Please remember that it is case sensitive. So that means that it has to be a capital W, small O, small R, small K, small S, small H, small O, small P, 2020. And as soon as you do that, you will have access to the workshop. Um, if you can, uh, please give me a thumbs up if you understood how to get online for the Flipgrid. Excellent, I've seen a couple of thumbs up. If you don't know how to use the thumbs up, um, down at the bottom of your screen, you will see a reactions thing with a happy face. This is, again, something that I use quite often with my students, and it helps you to get feedback uh, from your students. So if it's something they need to understand, if you get lots of thumbs up, it means that they're understanding. If you don't get many thumbs up, then it's probably an opportunity for you to repeat some of that information or go over it again. Okay, so again, for homework, you've got a little bit of homework I'm assigning you today. Please go ahead and uh, enter on to the Flipgrid. Please use the password. Uh, I look forward to seeing your videos and please watch other people's videos and comment on them. Uh, if they say something meaningful to you, or if there's something you wanna to add to what they've already said, please do that. Uh, we can start this small community off and uh, I think it will be a, an enjoyable experience. And then you'll get to see what your students experience. And if you like it, uh, you can go ahead and use Flipgrid as well. So uh, you'll notice there's a big green button that looks like this on the screen. That is the button you push to record your message for everyone when you are ready. All right, we are coming to the end of our workshop. Um, I'd like to end with just a couple of closing thoughts and ideas. Um, and as well, uh, if you are thinking about questions or things you would like me to talk about more, feel free to drop a question in the chat and I will do my best to address those questions at the end. So a couple of closing thoughts. Let's talk about this here for a quick second. So um, the first thing that I would like to mention is I wanna really emphasize this idea of emergency remote teaching or ERT. And the reason I'm doing that is because as teachers, we really need to give ourselves a bit of a break. Um, if you go on edX, for example, and that is the expectation of the course you are trying to put together, remember that those courses often have five or six different people working on them. And they've been developing that course for six months, a year, to get to that level of online course. We can't do that. We don't have the time. So we have to be good to ourselves and we have to understand what we can do online without pushing ourselves or our students too much. It's been a stressful semester. We are continuing to go into this pandemic um, and countries of course are reacting different ways, but this is going to be going on for the foreseeable future. So let's limit our expectations, do the best you can, but remember, keep it simple, find a community to help you with it, and um, do the best you can, of course. There are many tools available. I gave you a couple of tools today and some suggestions. So we, we talked a little bit, just to review, a little bit about Zoom, 
Um, and some of the functionalities like polls. Uh, we talked a little bit about Google Forms and the different types of powerful features that you can use Google Forms for, whether that's attendance or exams. And then we also talked about Flipgrid. Um, and Flipgrid, I hope that you will create videos and jump online and learn a little bit about these. My suggestion is that you get very good at a few tools, that you don't overstretch yourself. We've learned a lot this past semester, and you might want to add a tool or two to your toolbox, but don't overstretch yourself. There are thousands of things out there. Trying to become an expert in everything isn't going to help. So dig in, focus on what you know and what you're good at, and especially when we're moving into the fall semester to get ready and to prepare. And of course, finally, find a community, um, communities like this, Hopefully we can continue this conversation on Flipgrid after the workshop, but definitely it's important to find people in your context that you can work with, your teachers, um, or other people online that you can share ideas with. We all need support. It can be very isolating to be at home teaching all the time. So make sure you create those networks, find those people, and share ideas. Um, all of you have different important experiences and it's beneficial always to share these types of things with people. Okay, everybody. Um, the very, very last thing I would like you to do is to do a survey at the end. The PDF that I sent you earlier, uh, let me just send it to you one more time. It also has that QR code and the link directly on the PDF under the closing section. Um, please, please, please uh, fill out the form. It should take you about five or 10 minutes to fill it out, but it really helps me to um, make these workshops better and it helps me to improve my skills uh, and things. So I would really, really appreciate that kind of thing. And uh, just to close, uh, I want to just thank Warda Rizvi for organizing this and putting this together. Uh, we met in Nepal at a TESOL conference, and uh, it was a real delight to get a message from her to set something like this up. I really hope that it has been useful for you, and I really look forward to continuing this conversation on Flipgrid. Um, I, it's been kind of a one-way conversation today, but Flipgrid will allow us to go back and forth and share ideas. I am very, very interested in learning from you about these types of things. A um, couple of quick things. The, um, I just noticed a couple of questions coming in. Uh, if you do have questions, please put them in the chat. I'll stick around for another 10 minutes or so, 10, 15 minutes, uh, if people have questions they would like to ask or anything I can pass on, please let me know. The PDF, you will be able to find that in your Zoom on the, uh, I, I sent a document through the Zoom chat window so you can access it there. Also, if you fill out the closing survey, uh, this survey right here, there is a section at the bottom if you want me to send you or share the PDF of all the slides and the information. Um, so please fill out this survey if you're interested in getting that and I will certainly pass that on. Um, a couple of questions that have come in. Oh, uh, somebody's asked for me to share it over. Let me just share it one more time, one moment. Okay, here it comes. So everyone should have access to that now in the chat window. Um, we've got a question about uh, Kahoot, and can we have a session on Kahoot? Uh, that is not necessarily my area of expertise, but maybe uh, Warda Rizvi or somebody online right now that is really good at Kahoot can uh, get in touch and try to create some sort of a session. Nearpod, 
Uh, this is not something, a tool that I'm familiar with, so I would not be the one to give a session like this. But if people do know about Nearpod or Kahoot, please share this on our Flipgrid. The Flipgrid would be an excellent place to talk about those things and to share information about them if you have an expertise or you're familiar with them. Wonderful. Um, I, I think that's it, unless there's any more questions. Um, Warda Rizvi, if you would like to say some closing comments or words, you're welcome to. If not, a huge thank you, everybody, uh, for your time today.